There are so many aspects of Ken. We all think we know him, but to sum them all up uh, would be very difficult. If you ask me what his political feelings are, I would say I haven't the slightest idea. Words have always been something that clearly came to him with ease. I still marvel at him. I watch him speak and his words just, just flow. When Ken would announce for NASCAR, he always used to say that these were ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And that's what I think about when I think about Ken. He's an ordinary person doing extraordinary things. But never, ever lost track of his roots. Worst driver in the world, on the planet, bar none. And he comes up with these harebrained schemes, and you know, nine out of 10 times they work. And that infuriates us even more. The only problem I really had with him is he likes my wife more than he likes me. When you get to know Ken Squire, uh, you get to know Vermont. Ken really is a Renaissance man. I rarely use this word to describe people in Vermont, but I would consider him a Vermont treasure. When I think about the people who have influenced my life the most, my wife, my parents, one teacher, and Ken. The question is, where would we be today without Ken Squire? Ken has never lost sight of his roots. And what ties together everything that he does is his sense of community. You know, they say that Vermont is what America was. Whether it's the radio stations, the VSO, Thunder Road, everything is built upon informality. It's built upon neighborliness. It's built upon community. In 1931, Waterbury truly was just a crossroads. It was a railroad station and Route 100 and Route 2 intersection, and that was about it. Ken was born right around the corner from WDEV in what used to be an apartment building, and they were like on the second floor. And after doing all these things uh, uh, all around the world and the, and the sports and the Olympics, and he comes back here to Waterbury, and now that is the local funeral home. And he tells me, I'm probably the only guy I know that's going to enter the world and leave the world from the same room. When you look at the great broadcasters in the history of television sports, the great ones create their own language, their special language that becomes part of the language of the sport. And Ken had that ability to come up with phrases, descriptions that lasted forever and people would reference moments in a NASCAR race speaking squirees. He would talk about something about sugaring off of a, of a tree or something, and I think it had something to do with maple syrup, and, and someone would sugar off something during a race, and no one in the world outside of Vermont had any idea what he, what he was talking about, but you know, Ken had a way with words, and somehow they figured all that out. Nineteen seventy nine was such a banner year for NASCAR, in large part due to Ken Squire. He convinced CBS to put the Daytona five hundred flag to flag on TV. Nobody dreamed that it was possible. Nobody would have ever taken a chance on it. Ken Squire sold them on it. Stand by for our news. Two of the greatest fiddling here, fidgeting with first place, passing some of the strikes in the last lap, trying to take it home. It's all come down to this. We was running along there 20 seconds behind, racing with Darrell and AJ, and uh, the race was up front. Out of turn two, Donnie Allison in first. Where will Kale make his move? He comes to the inside. Donnie Allison throws the block. Kale hits him. He slides. Donnie Allison slides. They hit again. They climb into the turn. They're hitting the wall. They're head on the wall. They slide down to the inside. Let's watch those third place cars. They're out of it. Who is going to win it? Coming around for the 
finish between AJ Boyd and Richard Petty. All of a sudden, uh, we they crashed, and we wound up going from third to first. I mean, we didn't do anything. We didn't pass anybody. We didn't do nothing. The other guys just got out of the way. So it was a uh, kind of an odd situation when you when you really get down to it. But we we happened to be on the winning end of that. Coming down, Richard Petty is now pulling out in front. Darrell Waltrip is in second. AJ Boyd is in third. Here they come. Waltrip trying to slingshot. Petty is out in front. K.O. Yarbrough and Donnie Allison started crashing on the back straightaway. Ken called that event explicitly. I mean, literally, blow by blow. A $60,000 car becoming a 22-passenger school bus. But those words that will forever live in everyone's memory, the words that he uttered that were heard around the world, and there's a fight. Richard Petty, the great master, has just recorded his 186th career, and, and there's a fight between Cale Yarborough and Donnie Allison. The tempers overflowing. They're angry. They know they have lost. And what a bitter defeat. Well, Ken, after seeing this whole program, you probably think you're a pretty big deal. But uh, just always remember, you're just a Vermont woodchuck. I'm very proud to uh, share the Squire Hall Award that NASCAR came up with about a year or so ago. We've done a lot together, had a lot of fun together, and I hope to heck we can have a whole lot more. You're a great guy and I do love you, but I have to tell you, when you draw your last breath, all those used cars up in the barn are going to be at the top of the driveway with a big sign under their windscreen saying, free to a good home. Dad, one thing I've known for a long time is that everybody wants his or her parent to be proud of her. And I do know that you're proud of me, and I'm glad about that. But now that I have kids growing up, I realize it goes the other way, too. And what I want you to know, Dad, is that I'm very, very proud of you, that I see you as a man who knew what he loved and who knew what mattered and set himself on a course to do those things and to make it matter. And for that, I am grateful and proud. Mm -hmm.